All right, guys. Hey, it's Coach Mike. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever. Obviously, we didn't have school today. I told you we would have an assignment. So instead of giving you like a packet or something really kind of basic to do that really you might just Google the answers for anyway, I decided to give you this. It's a little video on the presentation that we would have done in class. This is probably a little bit more streamlined, so you're going to have to do a little bit of reading. Uh, if you haven't read the chapter, please make sure you do so. But we're going to talk about classic India, and really I'm going to focus primarily on what AP wants you to know. So let's be, be clear about this. We could talk about classic India for an entire year if we really needed to. This is a complex society. It's actually probably one of the more complex societies that we've talked about. It's also probably one of the least understood societies. But either way, make no mistake, their contributions to world history are massive. You know, when you talk about two major religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, you talk about the numerical system that we use today, Arabic numerals, uh, and you talk about the trading that they, that they did, where they were able to combine multiple cultures to make their own, it makes this pretty complex stuff. So, let's get started. So, a couple things. One, this is ancient Indian culture on uh, the Indus River Valley. This is not technically ancient India. Uh, this is the Indus River Valley. AP doesn't always ask about this. They might. And so that's why I'm putting them on there. Uh, very rarely do they put something on here. Uh, make sure that you understand this. This is 3500 BCE, right? So 3500 BCE. Very old civilization. Okay, a couple things. Geography, right? This area that you see here, this map, uh, it is actually not in India, it's in Pakistan. The Indus River Valley runs in Pakistan. So that's an important thing to kind of remember, that this is technically in Pakistan. Uh, and it's not the same people who live in Pakistan today. They came in through invasion. It's not the same people who live in India today. Uh, these people were more or less probably wiped out, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. So what makes this civilization important? Well, one, it's one of the oldest civilizations that we actually have record of. As you can see with the circles littered around here, there are multiple cities and excavation sites, and that's really what this is. This is uh, sites that they've found uh, th things from, um, the oldest being around 3500 BCE, and really it goes all the way up until about 1800 BCE. The main cities that they generally refer to, and really the only cities they'll ever remotely mention on the AP exam, uh, would be Harappa and then Mohenjo-Daro, City of the Dead, right? These two cities were pretty big. They were large cities. Uh, we know nothing about their governments. We know nothing about their religions. We know nothing about their culture. Uh, and that's not because they didn't have it. Uh, don't think for a second. Some people make the mistake of saying they had no written language. Well, that's that's wrong, and it's stupid to say so. They actually did have a written language. We just can't decipher it. We cannot translate it. Um, if you recall, we talked about the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone will allow us to translate uh, a lot of the earlier ancient or the other ancient languages. There was no Rosetta Stone for this because these guys were gone before that ever happened. So, you know, because of that, we know next to nothing about these societies. Everything we know is from archaeology. And so we know they had complex farming because we found tools. Uh, ironically, they've never found weapons. So militarily, we don't know anything about them or if they even had militaries. They are more just kind of like peaceful people, which would make sense as to why we never heard from them after a certain period of time. Uh, we do know that their source of wealth and everything was, was their farmland. And, you know, as I said before, if AP asks you about this, there's going to be one of two ways they do it. One is going to be in comparison with all the other River Valley civilizations, whether it's the Chinese, whether it's the Egyptians, whether it's the Mesopotamians. All of them start around rivers. And so that's important. Now, this river is actually pretty similar to that of the Egyptians. Um, it's also similar to Mesopotamia in the sense that there's multiple rivers. And if you see this, this map, there are a bunch of rivers around here. And it actually creates a large floodplain. And these rivers flood on the regular, um, like they do it all the time. And it's pretty much like clockwork and because of that flooding it allows for uh, farming to take place uh, complex farming this allows for large cities you can't have complex farming without large cities that's just you know civilization 101 as we've talked about before so with that being said let's think about it in this regard we know these civilizations had had, had to have had somewhat complex governments why because the cities Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa are built on grids Oh, a grid, right? Yeah, math. I know, I'm sorry, I'm bringing math to history. My bad. Um, so if they built a city on a grid, what that means is everything is evenly distributed. Uh, they also built things using the same materials. Buildings were generally the same size. Um, so everything was pretty much planned out to a T. 
Now this maximizes the amount of people you can fit in one area. It makes the streets a certain width. It allows for a lot better commerce. Um, but it also tells us something far more important. It tells us they had to have a complex government because individuals don't make this, right? Right. A single person does not make this, right? He doesn't. No, it's going to be a government does this. And so this kind of shows you that they had to have a large government. Uh, technology, we know they have some pretty good technology. Um, one, these little buildings here, uh, or at least the buildings they had, they were able to function at a pretty interesting rate uh, for two reasons. One, they did have some airflow that went in, and a lot of ancient civilizations did this, where they would build uh, little holes in the wall, essentially, that would capture air and bring them through air ducts that would filter in. And so they had some airflow that we think they had. Um, the other is a sewage system, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, the sewage system is pretty basic, right? And I'll, I'll show you my expert. That's a house, right? Yeah, it's an overhang for rain. Um, well, anyway, you would go to the bathroom. You know, you would do your your thing, and it would go down a little tunnel, and it would then go into a large sewer chain, and it would go using gravity out of the city. That's pretty basic, right? That's pretty amazing. And actually, most societies never had this. Um, European societies didn't have this for a long time. China, China didn't have this for a long time. So, you know, that's pretty impressive to do. And they had this in most of the houses they found. Now, whether or not this was the peasants or if this was more of an upper merchant class thing, then, you know, that's besides the point. But they still had it, and they had it in multiple things. So multiple houses, you know, you had your little your little sewage pipe that went out and filtered in the waste and brought it out probably into the river that they used for water. But that's, you know, that's ancient civilizations, right? Um, so that's pretty important. Uh, other than that, guys, you know, that's all you really need to know, uh, that, that they were some, you know, technologically advanced. Uh, we don't know much about them because of the Rosetta Stone. But the other thing that kind of is interesting about this group is we don't know how they, they died. Uh, it could have been a natural disaster. It's not like a volcano eruption where, where we can figure that out. Um, it could have been a famine, you know, which would have been pretty difficult with the amount of rivers they had. could have been colossal flooding caused everyone to move. More likely, we probably saw some outside invaders come in. And if these guys didn't have militaries and they had outside invaders come in from any of the regions that are around this area, they would have been completely destroyed. And that would have made a lot of sense. So there you have it. That's the ancient Indian civilizations uh, in, in all of their grandeur. But, like I said, as far as AP goes, I'm not sure exactly what you're going to need to know from them. Uh, but let's move on to the stuff that I know you will have to do on the AP exam because there's always questions about it. Um, and we have a test on it, so that makes sense too. Man, Indian civilization, right? So this is one of the most complex civilizations in history. Now, why is it complex? Well, it's complex because there aren't complex government structures. Uh, there is no high-end bureaucracy. They don't keep overly elaborate government records, though they do keep some. Um, in, in this, to be honest, it, it, it just didn't have the unity that other civilizations had. Um, and it didn't have the unity through conquest that other civilizations had. Um, like when you look at Mesopotamia, where the Babylonians took it over for long periods of time, or the Persians, and they were allowed to kind of combine societies. India generally throughout its history is going to be made up of city-states, at least at this early part. And then we'll have two major empires we'll talk about, the Maurya and the Gupta. And both of them aren't very long-lasting. We're talking about 200 years, and really those numbers are kind of skewed. We're really looking at 150 years, and, and then civil war breaks out, and then they're falling apart for a generation. That's what we're kind of looking at with these empires. Um, now, why is that? One, it's a lot of land. It's almost impossible to control that many people at this time. Especially if you don't have a complex government. Uh, to the social structure, the way India's social structure will work will actually kind of deter from a lot of the, the government structures and the overthrows that we saw in China and everything else. Um, and then you know, the other thing is that they get taken over by outsiders. And in fact, Indian civilization is so influenced by outside people, it's not even funny. And we'll talk about how that kind of went on. That doesn't mean they don't have their own distinct culture because they do, right? They really do have their own distinct culture. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, this is a diverse culture. Multiple languages spread all throughout the Indian subcontinent. Let's also remember, the Indian subcontinent includes multiple countries, as we talked about in class before. So let's get into actual Indian culture. Indian culture centers around one group of people, at least at the early aspects, and that is the Aryans, right? 
No, not the Nazi Aryans, right? This is not Hitler and, and those guys. No, these guys came from the Caucasus Mountains. They came on down, uh, probably nomadic hunters, something like that, uh, warrior people, and they came down and they took over northern India and then went into central India as well. Um, the Aryans eventually developed uh, a religious belief that will sort of be Hinduism, but it's not quite Hinduism. It, it develops into Hinduism. Hinduism is an interesting religion for a lot of reasons, uh, and we'll talk about that in, in just a second. The Vedas, right? Vedas, there we go, uh, is this bad boy. Uh, it's their holy script, right? Um, it is their their uh, religious text, and it kind of sets aside a lot of the things that made uh, Hinduism what it was. Um, so Hinduism is a polytheistic religion or sort of polytheistic. Honestly, it's, it's like an adaptive religion. It absorbs other parts of, of religion. So when the Muslims came in, Hinduism took some stuff from them. Uh, when Buddha develops, they take stuff from them. Um, and so Hinduism has that effect. And so it actually makes it a very long lasting religion because it doesn't just set get set in its ways. But realistically, we're looking at something that's sort of polytheistic, very polytheistic at this time. And it's extremely popular today. Hundreds upon hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people uh, or hundreds, hundreds of millions, sorry, of people um, worship it today. It is the dominant religion of India, not Buddhism. Buddhism is not going to be India's dominant religion. It will be for a little bit of time, and as we'll discover, that's not really Buddhism. So um, it definitely has its own things. So one of the things that Hinduism created um, is the caste system, and the caste system is one of the more unique – one of the more unique things created during this time period. Um, and the reason because it kind of controls society. It sets up – every belief structure that they have. You know, the Vedas and then the Upanishads that'll come around a little bit later, the religious texts are gonna really set aside social classes and the caste uh, will be something that is extremely important in this. So, let's talk about the caste. Whoa, it's blank. There's no pictures, there's no words, uh-oh. That means I gotta draw, and lucky for you guys, you kinda also have the idea that I'm a very good artist. So what is the caste system? Uh, political religious system that dominates Indian culture. This system lasts for thousands of years, and it goes into the 20th century, so it's pretty important to understanding their history for you know the rest of the course. It sets a foundation for their society, it sets a cultural norms that they're gonna use on an everyday basis. So, how do we, how do we look at this? Well. Uh, one, uh, we have to make sure we understand this is both a religious thing and a political thing. And if you notice, I put the religious part first. The religious part is probably the most important because the people fundamentally believe this as, as a result of their religion. Uh, this is primarily brought, brought in by Hinduism and the Aryans. So let's get into it. How do we look at it? Well, almost every textbook, almost every explanation you're going to see of this is going to draw a pyramid. And that's pretty basic, right? Pyramids. Egyptians had them, Chinese had them, everyone had them, right? Aliens. No, uh, it's just a really good way of showing something in this regard uh, because it allows us to show the larger number of people in one place. So how many casts are there? Well, that, no, that is a little tricky because most textbooks will give you about four or five. And then there's generally up to 300 plus casts. So let's look at these systems. Uh, we got one, two, three and then four and then we'll probably have one underneath here and that is your untouchable cast uh, we won't even talk about them they're just pariahs from society in fact pariah is the name uh, that we would use for it and they're just outcasts of society so the top cast the one that's the most important the one that runs society are the brahmas uh, the brahmins b-r-a-h-m-i-n-s are priests, for lack of a better term. Uh, priests worked really well, religious peoples. Um, the ruling class was also included in this at times, uh, though as society develops, we see the caste system tear off even more, and we're going to see ruling class get their own designation. But the priests do run society in a lot of ways, and this was designed to kind of make them the moral authority of India. And it's pretty, makes a lot of sense. And in fact, a lot of this is gonna make a lot of sense. Uh, the second class, and if we think about who brought this in, the Aryans brought this in. And what were they above anything else? They were warriors who prized horses. They, they took over all this area. So who are they gonna put in here? Uh, artists? No, it's gonna be warriors, right? 
And so the warrior class generally represents that second caste, uh, second most powerful. Um, realistically, India is going to be controlled by the warrior class politically. Uh, the warrior class will take over and fall, you know, as the periods of histories go on. And the warriors will be very well respected. And, and we see a strong history of conflict that takes place, especially in the early parts of Indian history. Let's move on to the third caste. The third caste is the Vyasa. Really, let's talk about this. It's a complex caste. It's actually the bigger, not the biggest one, but it's kind of the more specific one. Uh, we're looking at landowners. We're looking at merchants. And we're looking at high-end craftsmen, right? people who make specific things. Um, this is like almost like your middle upper class, I guess, uh, would be how you do it. Um, and so they would represent a pretty large structure, probably the most diverse in, in going up and down. Um, and then you get everyone else, right, which is the Sudra class, which represents workers. Uh, now, what did these workers do? Uh, these workers were farmers. Uh, as we know, Indian society, heavily farm-based, right, agricultural-based. Uh, cotton was one of the biggest products that they had. They also uh, were big into agricultural products. Any type of farming thing that you could think of, they pretty much did. India's geographic location ensured this because they got stuff from Asia or East Asia, and they got some from West Asia. And so their trading networks kind of ensured that. Middle Eastern trade via either roadways or by sea, after a while, also ensures this. And they're going to be trading cotton. is always one of their biggest exports. In fact, it's the biggest export. That's why the British Empire took them over later on. So uh, very important stuff. Now, what makes this system kind of like tick? Um, one, it's the religious nature of it. Uh, what you have to understand about this is that because it is religious, because this system is religious, it automatically automatically makes it something that people firmly believed in you know this isn't a class system where the lower class is looking and they're saying i want to be you know and i mean they do want to be in the upper class but jealousy is something they look down upon and there's a reason why um they believe hindus believe a lot in karma right um if you live good you are good if you live bad you are bad and you include that into reincarnation right if you include that into reincarnation uh, that changes a whole bunch of stuff uh, because they believed in reincarnation. They believed in uh, the, the rebirth of a soul. And so theoretically, if you were born a worker, if you were born a worker, in theory, you deserve to be a worker. If you were born a priest, you were the best of the best of society. Okay, and that is the basic premise. Now, look, this is so much more complex than this. This is so much bigger than this, but this is the basic format that I can kind of give you. And as long as you understand this, you'll understand uh, the basic stuff that they want you to know in terms of AP. Okay, so what does this actually create? What does this do for Indian society? Well, uh, one, it creates a lot of order. I want you to think about that. It creates order, right? It creates a lot of order. Because this allows for society to be seamless. It allows for people to have a set role. They understand their role. That's sort of similar to China in a way, right? Where Confucius believed that people had set roles in society and that they should do those roles for the betterment of the state. This is slightly different. Not the betterment of the state. Uh, but they believe the betterment of the soul, you did this right. So if you're a worker and you work really, really hard, maybe the next time you get reincarnated into here or you get reincarnated into here. So the idea is that you do your job as well as possible and you do it because that's what your soul's meant to do. This goes with dharma, this goes with karma, and this goes with reincarnation. It's a great control mechanism. You're poor because you were a terrible person in the last life. It sounds terrible to say, but that's what people believed. And if you wanted to improve yourself, you had to live a good life. And so in a lot of ways, this creates sort of a harmonious society. I guess we could sort of say that, um, though that's not quite the case, as, as we'll find out. Uh, society was slightly more complex. However, we know this isn't the only religious thing here. Uh, we're going to have other religious structures in India as well. Buddhism. Buddhism, 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 right? Uh, Buddhism great uh phenomenal religion one of the largest religions on earth um ironically not big in india as much anymore they still have it and actually hinduism adopted a lot of buddhism so they're still there um way bigger in asia way bigger in asia anyway let's talk about how it started um and it starts you know 
sort of like Confucianism in some ways, right? So we have this guy, uh, Siddhar uh, Siddhartha Gautama, right, who I probably mispronounced his name. I apologize. Whatever. Um, either way, he's a prince, right? And he lives this lavish lifestyle. And, you know, he's got everything he wants. He's, he's got, you know, wives. He, he's got the palace. But his dad never lets him out the palace. He never lets him out. Um, so he never sees the world. And so he thinks the world is like his palace. You know, you got to realize this guy never has a table without food. You know, he never has a room without light. He never has a situation where he's not the center of attention. And so what Gautama does is he snakes out of his palace. Um, we don't know quite when this happened. We know it's somewhere between 600 and 500 BCE. Uh, but he snuck out the palace. And he's searching for enlightenment, right? Searching for enlightenment. And what does he catch? He sees what society really is, right? Um, he sees the poor. He sees the suffering. He sees the masses of people who don't have what he has. And he sees the cruelness. He sees crime. He sees things that make him sick to his stomach. As the holy scriptures or, or as the writings from Buddhism talk about, he saw a sick person, a poor person, and a dead person. And from that, he wondered, why could there be this much suffering, right? Why could there be all this suffering in the world? Uh, and he not even realize it. And so what he does is he gives up all of his possessions. He says, you know what? I don't need to be this prince. I will try and find my own inner way. And Buddhism is so much about self-finding, right? This is not Confucianism where it's, you know, the state or improvement of society. And even Hinduism to a degree is, is for the order of society. Buddhism is for self. And that's what Buddha does. And the picture you see here um, of Buddha is actually him meditating under a tree. As the story goes, he meditates under a tree for uh, a month, and after a month of meditating, uh, he finds nirvana, right? He finds the meaning of life. That's what he said. He, he believes that. He says, I, find the me I found the meaning of life, and he got followers, and so what he basically said is that life, right? Or they read him the Buddha first, right? They read him the Buddha, and then he says, life is suffering, it says the source of suffering is desire. To stop suffering, you have to rid yourself of desire. That seems pretty basic, right? That's pretty basic. Um, and then he says to do all of this, you have to follow the Eightfold Path. Now, the Eightfold Path is pretty interesting. Um, realistically, the Eightfold Path deals with um, essentially how to live life to be pure, right? And it really just, it's about kindness. And in a lot of ways, uh, that's really all it preaches. Uh, one of the things that Buddha did not like was the caste system. And so, of course, imagine this. What group of people converted to Buddhism? The lower class, right? The lower class converts to this because, quite frankly, they didn't like the caste system because they were in the lower class. Um, he believed you could, you could get to nirvana inside of this life. It wasn't just an afterlife. And so that's what Buddhism really was. There aren't big doc indoctrinated laws. Uh, he didn't want to create that. He didn't want to create this giant priest thing. He didn't want to be worshipped. And although a lot of that did occur, and it did occur especially in the Chinese implementation of Buddhism, uh, where we see it kind of adapted through Chinese society and we see it taken through monks and through various other you know prisms, that's essentially what he believed. He believed in more inner peace. It's not a government religion. If you think about it in that regards, it's all about individuality, which makes it far less of a government sponsored thing. So how does it spread? It spreads because of Indian culture, uh, trade. Uh, Indians were in the middle of the world at the time. And then so trade allowed this to spread. And actually there's going to be one ruler that also does this a lot. His name is going to be Ashoka. And we're going to get to him in just a minute. There are two major empires, two major Indian empires, as we can see here. Uh, we have the Mariahs, right? The Mariahan Empire and the Gupta Empire. I love the Gupta. It's just my, it's my favorite one of all, of all the empires. It's got a great name. Um, ironically, I, I mean, the Mariah are actually probably more interesting to talk about. Um, they're also bigger, right? Look at the Mariah. Huge empire, right? Um, now, these in the Gupta, big on its own right, right? Still pretty big. Not as big. Um, and that's at their peaks, by the way. They did not maintain these for these time periods. We're talking like maybe like a 30-year period where they maintained these sizes, and then they actually started to dissipate over time. Uh, they did not maintain this the whole time. And so that's important to kind of recognize. The other thing are the, the ending points. Uh, the ending points are usually like 
following 50 years of wars. So the ending points are actually staggered a little bit. The Gupta is kind of a more of an estimation, but either way, we're going to talk way more about the Mariah than the Gupta, though. We'll, we'll give them both kind of there. So here's some, some things about the empires and politics. One, Indian politics is very bizarre. Uh, it's not... It's not bureaucratic in the least, and the caste system kind of ensured that. There just wasn't room for a bureaucracy in the caste system. And so what you saw were, I mean, obviously you saw the warrior class running society, and when they did have these large empires, specifically the Marian Empire, this is a military state, okay, that takes over. And they're going to do so with the sword. This isn't going to be like a, hey, everybody, let's get together and we'll get along. No, this is this is by the sword. Um, if we think about the other parts of their, you know, their structures – Almost equated to feudalism, right? You have the, the local regional rulers who are going to essentially pay taxes to the, the larger state, and the only way the state can maintain control is if they have a large military. And so a guy like Chandragupta and, and Ashoka in the Mauryan Empire maintain absolute authority because they have a huge army. They have a massive army, and so they're able to use that to control the roadways, to control the cities, and that ensures the peace and prosperity of the empire, right? Um, but when they die… It all falls apart and allows these empires to dissipate because the lords end up becoming more powerful than they rebel because they think they should rule, and that's how it kind of runs. So this is semi-feudalistic in a lot of ways, uh, far more independent city-state type, type mindset. Um, a lot of times they're not quite unified. The one thing that does unify them is trade, and actually the Marian Empire in particular are really big into trade. Uh, the Marian Empire is going to have massive amounts of roadways that they build all throughout India. And these roadways are extremely important because they're going to connect the whole country via trade. It's going to prevent a whole bunch of things like famine and stuff like that. They're able to spread spread the, uh, the food around. Uh, they're also able to produce agricultural goods that trade overseas. Um, they will start overseas trade uh, in both directions, so they will be going across the – the Arabian Sea, right, and they will be going across the Bay of Bengal and then, then to the South China Sea. So they will be going uh, all the way across uh, to do trade in multiple directions, and that's going to be something that both empires do. Uh, both empires are going to use trade, uh, maritime trade, to their advantage, and it, it actually is what helps spread Buddhism to China. Uh, it's spread through trade, right? So most people would not live in large cities, right? Most people would have lived in small villages uh, that are run by large landowners. They'd have worked in the peasantry class. Is this any different than any other society we're talking about? No, it's actually a commonality of almost every ancient civilization. The majority of people are laborers who live on rural settings. So, and it will be that way all the way until the 1800s. My dude. Chandragupta. Chandragupta is a, a really cool character in history. Um, it's a shame we don't have more time to talk about him. Look, AP is not going to ask you a single question about him. Um, you know What they could do, though, and, and it would be an interesting thing, and actually I find this to be more of an essay-type scenario as well, is how his empire actually started. We're talking about change over time. Uh, we're talking about causation, right? So what causes this to happen? Now, you're looking at this map, and you're saying, Coach, what are you doing? This isn't even a map of of India. No, this is actually a map of Alexander the Great's empire. This is Alexander the Great. And you're like, yes, finally Greece. No, we still have another chapter for that. However, let's point this out. Alexander the Great uh, extended all the way into India, uh, in particular the, the Battle of the Hypaspis River, which is right here. It's one of the last major battles Alexander the Great fights. Uh, this is a massive military fight, uh, and it actually changes the course of Indian history. Because of this fight, leaders like Chandragupta, who witness it and hear about it, um, they see a force under Alexander the Great that is smaller than theirs. It doesn't have the, the elephants like they have. It doesn't have some of the weaponry they have, but it is able to destroy their military. Uh, you know, Three to one advantage in their they decimate the Indian military. Um, the Alexander the Great suffered great losses uh, during this battle as well and ended up having to leave as a result. But nonetheless, they destroy the, this force that's there. Uh, and realistically, if Alexander had survived uh, following this and following going home, uh, he probably would have come back and it would have been an interesting fight. Chandragupta, though, kind of learns from this and, you know, he realizes that Alexander the Great's military was good for one reason. It was professional. Alexander the Great benefited off of his father, Philip II, who created a professional army. Bottom line, 
you know, all of his soldiers were soldiers. They were not farmers given given uh, pikes. They were just soldiers. And so because of this, Chandragupta realizes that to rule this area, to take over India, you need a strong military, military might. So he decides he's going to build up his own military. And that's extremely important because the military aspect is what's going to define his rule. Okay, Chandragupta will go on to take over most of India or large portions of it. Um, however, he's hated. He's vilified by a lot of people. He kills a whole bunch of the, the, the actual nobility when he does this. But then he does what Alexander the Great did. He appoints a lot of his generals in charge of places. You know, People who are now essentially leaping in the caste system, uh, he appoints them into the, the regional rulership over these, these cities that he takes over. Why does he do that? Because now you're loyal to me because I gave you that job. That's his theory at least. However, you know, there are writings about, about Chandragupta where he wouldn't sleep in the same place for more than five hours, and he had people test his food because he thought he was going to be poisoned, uh, and he had a military guard at all times at his palace. And it really kind of creates this thing where you, you, know, you start to think about him as a guy who's paranoid, and that's kind of sad. He lives, lives to a pretty ripe old age, ends up dying of old age. Um, he does a bunch of other things that are important. He built massive roadways, as I said before. Uh, the roadways unified the area via trade, but more specifically, I know we like to say, oh yeah, the roadways, it helped out economics. It allows him to move his military rather quickly. And that's what he did to put down revolts. Um, and he really has a zero tolerance policy on people who don't like him. Uh, and if he finds out about it, he has them eliminated and replaced. And that tends to be what he can do. Um, so yeah. That's pretty much it. Uh, realistically, though, the more important Indian ruler, the one that AP does ask about, is Ashoka, who we're going to talk about now. Ah, Ashoka. Right, there we go. Look at that. And we just got two pictures, so all of you are pissed now because you have to actually take notes. So Ashoka um, is, as you can see from the pictures here, 273 to 232. Uh, not a long period of time. Not at all. Uh, but he has a good run of it. 60 years almost. That's pretty good. Ashoka is a military ruler much like his grandfather Chandragupta. He has a strong professionalized military that his grandfather and his father put into place for him, and he is going to conquer all of India. That big map that we saw earlier, that's him. He's the guy who did it. And in fact, he does it so well that it causes him to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, midlife crisis, right? Well, there's a, there's a battle called the Battle of Kalinga. Kalinga, K-A-L-I-N-G-A, -L -L Kalinga, the Battle of Kalinga, where according to records, and he believes he, that almost 140,000 people died. We don't quite know how many people died. We do know in the, to the whole war, we're looking at 180 to 200,000. It's a, it's a decently long war. But in the last battle, the Battle of Kalinga, he says he sees the bodies of over 100,000 people, and they were killed at his hand. It was called the Slaughter of Kalinga. And it caused him to just go into a deep depression. And through this deep depression, he met with some, some priests who were Buddhists, and Ashoka converted to Buddhism. Sort of. Sort of. Uh, and actually, it's interesting because Ashoka, the leader of India, converting to Buddhism is pretty important because what he did as a result of this is he began to build Buddhist temples all throughout India. Uh, he said, this is my goal is to do this. And you're looking at one right here. Uh, he built a, a series of what he, what he calls the stupas. Uh, stupa. Yeah, great term, right? Um, this one's a dome, which is which shows a lot of uh, a lot of intelligence uh, by their society to build a dome. Uh, the stupas were impressive. They're Buddhist temples. He also built Hindu temples. Why? Because he has a huge population who's Hindu, so he's going to do that, and it makes perfect sense. He, like his grandfather, is a military ruler, so he runs India with an iron fist. But after this Buddhism conversion, he's like, we shouldn't be killing people, right? We we shouldn't be doing all these things. We should be finding inner peace. Well, sort of. Okay. Uh, let's not let's not actually say he was he was completely Buddhist because he kind of isn't. Um, he takes parts of Buddhism and adopts them to himself, which is actually why Buddhism is very effective and spreads all throughout the world uh, because of that nature of it. Realistically, though, he allows Hinduism to remain, and Hinduism and Buddhism have this weird symbiotic relationship in Indian history uh, going forward where they do kind of take and, take and push from each other. Um, he not only built temples everywhere, um, as we see from the artwork, uh, he did a bunch of other stuff. He spread it through to other people. Uh, they spread it to an area called Sri Lanka, which is an island right off the coast. They spread it to Arabia. They spread it to uh, to East Asia. And so they sent Buddhism everywhere, and he sends monks to preach it and everything else. This is actually how it gets into China. 
okay, or into to Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and all that, little, Myanmar, all those places, uh, and it eventually get into China as a result of these these spreads. And of course, Buddhism catches on with the lower classes almost everywhere it goes. And so Ashoka, realistically, you know, is he that important because of his military ventures? Not so much. Uh, what they're going to ask you about is Buddhism. He is a direct spreader of Buddhism. You can, you know, you could call him the Constantine of Buddhism, right? Because just like Constantine with the Roman Empire, Ashoka ended up spreading it throughout his. And the results allowed Buddhism to become one of the most major religions on earth. So what happened to his empire? Well, about 50 years after he died, their empire fell apart. Uh, why? Well, he was a good ruler. His dad was pretty good. His grandfather was pretty good. Uh, his son, not so much, and his grandson, not so much. And then it eventually just fell apart like that. You didn't have strong rulers. The problem with Indian society as a whole was it depended too much on the individual. You had to have a strong person in charge to maintain order. And that ultimately caused big problems for them. So... The Gupta Empire, we're going to do them pretty quick. Uh, the Gupta Empire are, you know, not politically elaborate. They take place from 300 to 500 CE. So this is the furthest we've gotten so far in, in AP world. Woohoo! We're, you know, past the, the CE, BCE line. They're not elaborate politically. The same structure politically, exact same structure. We're talking about feudalistic type mindsets. Um, however, they're far more peaceful. They negotiate things far more. Uh, they tend to not just go to war with one another over everything. On the right here, we see some coinage, right? This coinage shows a couple different things. Uh, one, we see uh, religious in nature on the coins. Uh, the Gupta Empire bring Hinduism back. Uh, the Gupta Empire is really where Hinduism makes its, its really big comeback. It almost completely eliminates Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent. Um, it doesn't do so by military conquest. It does so by absor absorption. It actually absorbs a lot of Buddhist teachings, a lot of Buddhist practices. They even make a Hindu god representation of Buddha uh, at one point in time. So, you know, this is what eventually it causes. Uh, this is a very, it's a, a rich empire. They make lots of money with trade. Uh, they're gonna be trading with the, the Middle East uh, all the way to Rome, essentially. And then they're also gonna be trading uh, into China as well. Uh, very peaceful, very stable. However, it's a short-lived empire, 300 to 500. What we're really looking at is about 300 to 450, and then we're, we're looking at a downfall after that. Uh, they're going to be invaded from the outside by the Huns and be completely destroyed in that regard, and the Huns are going to end up you know, staying for a bit and running it and becoming Hindus themselves because it allowed for them to maintain power. It made sense. Um, one thing that's kind of important is the term guru. Uh, guru. Uh, G U R U S. Uh, the gurus became extremely powerful at this point. These are priests, um, and they became the the political power of India during them. And so the gurus became the complete political power. Um, religion and government kind of kind of mesh up here uh, in that regard. So pretty important. Uh, and we'll even see, like I said, on the coinage, we see symbolism uh, from this religion on the coinage here. So, uh, yeah, that's the Gupta. It's about culture is really what's important, and we're almost done, guys. We're, we're about to be finished. Um, culture is essentially the most important part of Indian civilization that we talk about this early period. Uh, one, two religions, not one, but two, right? Two religions develop under here. Hinduism and Buddhism both exist today. Both have massive impacts on our society. Um, a rich history of art, and I'm not talking about the painting right here. This is actually a more contemporary painting, um, but they have massive amounts of art. A lot of their art was done with architecture. Uh, you saw a dome earlier. That's pretty impressive. Uh, carvings, engravings. They also did have, have uh, paintings, tapestries, uh, and things of that nature as well. Um, a little bit of mosaic art that they get eventually from the Byzantines too. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've always found fun is the epic stories, the literature that came out of them. Um, and actually, this painting is a depiction of one of the literature events, which is Sinbad the Sailor. Um, and Sinbad uh, is a sailor who has all these adventures on the high seas, battles monsters and stuff like that. And it's pretty good. Um, they have a Jack the Giant Slayer type story. They have a whole bunch of things to that nature. So they have a highly developed literature sense, which is pretty cool stuff. Um, math and science is interesting. I mean, again, they were able to build domes, which shows that they're scientifically pretty able. They studied the stars. Uh, they wanted to predict why the Earth did certain things. They tried to study nature in a lot of ways. Um, math and numbers are really important for us uh, because they develop what are called Arabic numerals. 
Arabic numerals are what we use now. Why do we call them Arabic numerals and not, not Indian numerals? Well, because the Arabs used it from them. Then the Europeans got it from the Arabs, so they called it Arabic numerals. There you go. Um, so, you know, the number system, which was developed early on, um, is our, our number system that we use today. Uh, their economy is so interesting in a lot of ways, too, because they had, uh, unlike a lot of places, they actually exported a lot of stuff. Uh, they did a lot of import-export stuff because of the sea trade and their lo geographic location. Um, they didn't necessarily need food, but they were able to do finite materials like that. So imported, exported, pretty important stuff. The roles of merchants, uh, this is a big deal, especially when you talk about a comparison. Uh, merchants are far more prominent in India. Uh, their roles were a lot higher. They were far more well regarded than Confucius China. So let's remember that as we kind of go forward. And then here we are at the end. This is our task, right? This will eventually be our task. India and China. So let's look at a couple things. One, uh, India and China. And I divided it up luckily for you guys. See, eh, look at that. India and China. India, not always unified. China, extremely unified. Okay, uh, we have large governments here, complex bureaucracy in China, uh, a political structure that has thousands of people involved. In India, far more simplistic, right? Hundreds of people involved, um, but far more on almost like a warlord type basis where they're paying homage to the ruler and stuff like that. Not to mention, it's not one country for the most part. For the most part, we're seeing city states rise and fall, rise and fall, but we don't see empires develop in that classic sense. We see two. Uh, but they're not nearly as big or as or as in, not important, but not as big or, or as politically unified as, say, the Chinese ones. Um, they're both agricultural based societies. That similarity is completely there. Um, large amounts of farming, an abundance of that uh, silk and cotton from both sides, respectively. So that's an important thing. Um, religion is an interesting prospect here, right? Because religion unifies India. The caste system in Hinduism don't make the mistake of being like, well, Buddhism and Hinduism fought. No. Not necessarily, right? Um, Hinduism and Buddhism uh, kind of molded into each other. And Hinduism really does unify the country with the caste system. And that brings us to that strict social caste, uh, strict social class system. Uh, that really defines India as a whole. And it's extremely important to kind of point that out. You know, China had this, right? It did have a social class system. But let's think about this. The social class system in India is based almost entirely on religion and based off of those beliefs. In China, a lot of it's based off of family honor and then loyalty to the state right confucius ideologies so that's a little bit different now don't make the mistake of saying well china had social mobility because of this the, the the civil service exam in theory in practice probably not uh both societies were you know if you were poor you were pretty much poor um though china obviously has a little bit more flexibility um, with people getting into government positions. And that's what's important, right? Their social structure at the top end is flexible, uh, while in India it's far less flexible. They both prize art and literature, bottom line. You know, the economic thing is kind of interesting too. China does not focus on external trade. A lot of it's internal. They build roadways that connect each other internally. Yes, they built the Silk Road, um, and that's semi important. It's actually far more important later on past this. But early China, the internal trade, think about how many people are living there, actually is the most important thing. India did the internal thing, but they had far more external trade, right? Sailing both west and east and land routes both west and east allowed them to spread the religion too, uh, which is important, which is actually how the religion got here. So there you have it. And by the way, remember, this is the essay we're going to take. Uh, so I'd be ready for it. So your job for next class, guys. Um, the next class, I'm not going to give you the essay because that would be kind of cruel and unusual punishment. What I want you guys to do from the last two chapters, that's China and India, I want you to create 20 questions. So create 20 questions. These are discussion questions. Okay, so they should be open-ended. They should allow us to actually talk about them a little bit more. Um, and we're going to hold a circle discussion on these two countries. Uh, you can be, you can be specific to one. You can compare them to each other in these questions. That is completely up to you. But I need 20 questions. I would have them printed out or handwritten, one or the other, so you can use them. And this is going to be for a grade. Okay, so this is graded. Uh, it's graded on a couple of different things. It's graded on answers. So when people ask questions, whether or not you're answering, um, and then asking, are you asking questions? Silence is not really an option in this scenario. So... And I will collect these questions. 
So guys, I hope you enjoyed this little digital lesson. I uh, got it just under 45 minutes, which is a lot less than a normal class. So enjoy. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your little break.